All right. If I could get everyone to take their seat, please. Grab that last cup of coffee. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to 2015, the Jones Seminar Series for the New Year. It's a pleasure to kick things off, and it's an extra special pleasure to kick things off with one of our own, Kofi Odom, Professor Kofi Odami, uh, who will start us off in the new year. Just uh, 15 minutes ago, I knocked on his door and said, you're giving the seminar, right? And I saw him deriving equations on his whiteboard in his office, and I, I think uh, he's the most calm, collected speaker I've known uh, in the seminar series. Certainly uh, less nervous than I would be. Uh, But it's really a pleasure to have him here. And so for those of you who haven't met him or worked with him in a class, um, Kofi received his uh, bachelor magna cum laude from Cornell University in electrical and computer engineering back in 2002. He stayed on and did a master's of science in electrical and computer engineering at Cornell and then moved on to Georgia Tech where he finished his Ph.D., in the same area in 2008. And since then, I believe, he's been here at Dartmouth College as an assistant professor where he teaches uh, Engines 32 Electronics, which he's doing this term, Engines 126 Analog and Integrated Circuit Design, and Engineering 129 Instrumentation and Measurement. uh, uh, He is an expert in analog integrated circuits for nonlinear signal processing His research group is developing ultra-low power circuits for implantable and wearable biomedical devices, next-generation image sensors. And uh, so today he'll be talking about building wearable biomedical devices. Kofi, thank you. Thank you, Professor Polk, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So today I'm going to talk about biomedical wearable devices. And I want to start off by explaining why I'm interested in this topic. You see, the uh, U.S. population is aging, and chronic diseases are taking up a bigger and bigger percentage of the total healthcare expenditure in this country. So we're talking about 85% of all healthcare dollars being spent on chronic diseases. And that comes to about uh, over $2 trillion every year spent on chronic diseases alone. That's just the financial cost. Seven out of ten deaths in this country are due to chronic diseases as well. Okay, now when I talk about chronic diseases, I'm talking about the usual suspects. I'm talking about diabetes, heart disease and stroke, asthma and COPD, etc. And What we are learning is that there is this growing consensus that the current model of healthcare delivery, which is hospital-centric and reactive, is inadequate for treating these conditions. What we need to do is to take the hospital-centered healthcare delivery model and shift it to a patient-centered, proactive sort of model. We need a healthcare delivery model that doesn't just respond to exacerbations in the patient's conditions. Rather, we need to take a more active role in the day-to-day management of the, health, of the patient's health. Okay? Now, to achieve this, we are going to need advanced technology that can continuously and unobtrusively monitor the healthcare status of the patient. In addition, we're going to need advanced assistive technology that improves the quality of life of people with impairments and also increases their their level of autonomy. So this is essentially the definition of a wearable biomedical device. And in my lab, we're looking at building devices that have got applications in asthma monitoring, in monitoring heart health, and even in... um, hearing impairment. Okay, so let us uh, take a look at asthma monitoring and see what, 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 I'm, what I'm doing in my lab today. Before I start, why don't we take a second to study this chart of asthma prevalence in the United States. So it shows that regardless of age, sex, race, or ethnicity, 
Across the board, the U.S. population, about 8% of the U.S. population suffers from asthma. So that is 25 million people suffering from asthma. And every year, they suffer exacerbations in their disease that are serious enough to warrant 2 million ER visits, half a million hospitalizations, and millions and millions of sick days taken off from work and from school. Okay, so now, even though there's no outright cure for asthma, there is a way to reduce the number of exacerbations. There's a way to do this, and, and that is based on this thing called asthma self-management. The idea of asthma self-management is pretty simple. The patient makes a daily diary of their symptoms and their medication use. And based on the severity of symptoms and the frequency of medication use, they take some measures that are, that are stated by some predetermined asthma action plan. And all the patient has to do is to follow the self-management plan, and they can reduce their risk of hospitalization by 40%. So that's great news. The bad news is that about 75% of asthma patients do not use this self-management plan. Half of all patients were never educated on how to use them, and a quarter of patients might have been educated, but for some reason are non-compliant with their physician's instructions. Okay, so we've got a huge number of people who could be using this scheme to reduce their risk of hospitalizations, and yet they don't. So this is where my lab comes in. This is where the asthma monitoring device comes in. The idea is to develop a system that requires no training and almost no effort on the part of the patient. Okay? And it is centered on this tiny device that has got the uh, shape and the form factor of a Band-Aid. So the idea is we're gonna take this electronic Band-Aid. This is a, um, an early prototype of the device. We're gonna take this Band-Aid, electronic Band-Aid, right? Stick it to the patient's chest. The device is going to record lung sounds and breathing. It's going to transmit these sounds to a smartphone. And on the smartphone, we're going to be running a machine learning algorithm that classifies and detects any cough or wheeze events in the sound. Now, these symptoms are going to be entered into a smartphone app, and these entries are going to be analyzed. And according to the analysis, the patient will receive notifications if he has to take any action according to the asthma action plan. So that's the idea. Now, of course, there are lots of challenges with having this continuous monitoring device. One big issue is motion artifact. Now, we would like our device to sit flush and stay stationary against the patient's chest, but inevitably, it's going to be suffering from some sort of mechanical disturbance. This mechanical disturbance will translate to motion artifact, which corrupts the lung sounds that we're trying to record. So that's one. Another issue is patients to patient variability. Patients come in all different shapes and sizes. Patients have different physiologies. And this device, from one use to the next, is going to probably be stuck on at different parts of the chest. So this means that a bout of coughing or an episode of wheezing is going to sound very different from one scenario to the next. The way we're trying to uh, mitigate this issue of variability is we are designing machine learning algorithms that are trained on a generic set of data. And then once these algorithms are applied to a specific patient, the algorithm does the self-learning where it slow, slowly adapts to the specifics of the patient. And then another big issue is power consumption. So a key characteristic of our device is that it needs to be small and cheap and more or less maintenance-free. Among other things, this means that we don't want the patient or the user, we don't want the user having to worry about recharging their device every night, for example. 
So we need this device to be completely self-powered. It's going to have to harvest energy from the environment. Now, since it's a tiny little device that is sitting underneath the patient's clothing, the most feasible strategy is to do um, vibrational energy harvesting from the patient's natural motions. Okay? Now, if we're talking about vibrational energy harvesting from the patient's natural motion, we're not talking about getting a lot of energy. Okay? With such a tiny device, we can hope to generate maybe 30 to 40 microwatts of power. So if you took your electronics and circuits textbook, cracked it open, and tried to de design a conventional device that was supposed to record sounds continuously, digitize them, and then transmit them to a smartphone, you would be out of luck because the very first portion of your device, the sensor interface that converts physical signals into digital ones and zeros, that alone is going to consume way more power than you have available. So we have to be pretty frugal with the little power, the, the, the little power that we have. And one way to do this is to set the device into a hibernation mode, sort of standby, and wake it up only when an interesting event occurs. Even when we wake the, the sensor up, we have to be pretty careful about the data that we choose to process and how much power we spend processing this data. So along these lines, we are developing this concept of bandwidth adaptive processing. So the idea of bandwidth adaptive, adaptive processing is this. It's based on the fact that lung sounds coming from a, a patient's chest do not have a constant bandwidth. As you can see from this spectrogram, the bandwidth varies quite a bit over time. Now, a conventional sensor is designed so that it is, it is always able to handle the maximum worst case expected bandwidth of the incoming signal. That's a pretty wasteful design strategy because, as you can see, it's only very rarely that the signal actually takes up that entire maximum bandwidth. Okay? So with bandwidth adaptive processing, the idea is that the sensor will track the bandwidth of the incoming signal, and it will adapt its power consumption and processing effort to match whatever the short time bandwidth of the signal is. Specifically, the sensor will, will adapt its sampling rate, it will adapt its cutoff frequency, it will even adapt its noise power spectral density, all in order to change its power consumption only as and when necessary and have a, um, an average low power consumption. So this is what the uh, sensor interface looks like, sort of a high level system diagram of it. The central portion is that block called the bandwidth extractor. The job of the bandwidth extractor is to take the incoming signal, analyze it, and figure out what the short term bandwidth is. Now, based on what the bandwidth extractor determines the bandwidth to be, it is going to change various parameters and power consumption of each component in the sensor. Okay? So what we had to do was we had to split the bandwidth extractor into two main components, one to deal with wheeze and one to deal with cough. The reason being is wheeze and cough have got fairly distinct spectrotemporal characteristics. So allow me to go a little bit in depth into the wheeze component of our bandwidth extractor. So let's start by understanding what a wheeze looks like in the uh, spectrotemporal domain. I should explain that for asthma, wheeze is more, more often than not polyphonic. That means that there's a fundamental frequency tone, and then there are a bunch of harmonics following that. Most of the energy is in the third harmonic and below. So all we have to do is to figure out what the harmonics of the wheeze signal are, and then we can take the third harmonic as a representation of the short time bandwidth. Okay? So this is the scheme we used. We had 
a bank of harmonically linked adaptive bandpass filters. That means that the center frequency of each of these filters was just an integer multiple of the other. And then we pass the input signal through this bank of bandpass filters, and then we sum up their output. Now at the same time, we adapt the central frequency of each of those filters. We adapt those frequencies while trying to minimize the error difference between the output of the filters and the input signal. So once we succeed in minimizing this error, it means that each center frequency of the filters is tracking a unique harmonic of the Wii's signal. Okay? And if we take the third harmonic, we can call that the short time bandwidth. So this is what the circuit implementation looks like. I put this up just for fun. Um, <laughs> uh, so that, these are your harmonically linked filters, right? We implemented those as GMC filters. The adaptive algorithm is this mess over here. It's a bunch of circuits and these um, components called translinear systems. And then the short term bandwidth is represented at the corner over here that's I omega current, okay? So if we pass a Wii signal through this circuit, we are actually able to extract the harmonics as the center frequencies of each of those filters. And like I mentioned, the third harmonic is what we're calling the short time bandwidth, okay? So to quantify the impact of this bandwidth extraction and bandwidth adaptive processing on the power consumption, because that's what we're interested in, of the sensor, we passed a chirp signal into our device. And we monitored the current consumption of the device as the chirp increased in frequency. You can think of the current consumption as a measure of power. And as you can see, the current consumption actually does track the chirp frequency. And on average, we are burning about 50% as much power as would have been needed for a device that was always um, consuming the maximum worst case. Okay? So now a chirp signal is easy to understand, but it's kind of really idealized and just a toy example. When we pass an actual long sound through our device and measure the sort of power consumption we're getting, we find that we were able to reduce power consumption by almost a factor of three, okay? So taking this idea of bandwidth adaptive processing and adding other things like compressive sensing, we can really reduce the power consumption. And the idea of having a self-powered um, device is really feasible. And this is very important because the patient would be much more likely to use our device if it is self-contained and has more or less zero maintenance, okay? All right, so let us, let us talk about another project. I want to talk about the wearable cardiac output device. And the background of this project is that we have about five million people in the U.S. who suffer from chronic heart disease and the prevalence increases as we go up in age. And uh, patients with chronic heart disease are at a serious risk of suffering acute decompensated heart failure, right? And this accounts for one million hospitalizations every year. Now, so many hospitalizations put a huge burden on both the patient and the healthcare system as a whole. So from the patient's perspective, there is the huge harm of um, perhaps medical error and hospital-acquired infections. Okay, so you do not want to go into the hospital for these reasons. And then from the healthcare system's perspective, this costs $30 billion per year. Also, emergency care diverts resources away from elective care, and it also disrupts patient waiting lists. All right, so for all these reasons, we want to avoid hospitalization. And so various healthcare providers have adopted this telemonitoring model. The idea of telemonitoring is that the patient sits at the comfort, in the comfort of their home, 
and they take daily measurements of weight, blood pressure, and heart rate. These measurements are transmitted to the hospital, and over there, the nurse studies the, the data and makes an assessment of the heart status, of the heart health status of the patient. Now, unfortunately, we still haven't conclusively established that telemonitoring is actually helpful in reducing hospitalizations. There are two main reasons for this. First of all, these measurements like weight and heart rate and blood pressure, they lack the specificity and sensitivity to accurately predict heart failure events. That's one. The second thing is that these parameters that we're measuring are sort of following the development of symptoms. So it forces the doctor to play more of a reactive role than a proactive role in managing the patient's health. Okay, so imagine if instead of relying on these proxy measurements, we had a way to directly measure the hemodynamic status of the patient from home. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with the wearable cardiac output device. We're working on this in collaboration with Professor Halter's bioimpedance lab here at Thea, as well as the cardiology department at DHMC. So the idea with the cardiac output device is we are using something called electrical impedance tomography. And that's, a, uh, that's an Im imaging technology that has a pretty long history of research and development here at Thayer. And with EIT, we inject tiny sinusoidal amounts of current into the patient's chest. And these currents generate boundary voltages. We grab these boundary voltages, measure them, and then use them in a reconstruction algorithm. The reconstruction algorithm then creates a tomography-like impedance map of the tissue and internal organs of the heart. So this is an actual um, impedance map that I borrowed from Professor Halt, actually. The dark regions are regions of um, low impedance, and the brighter regions are regions of high impedance. So we've got the two lungs over here showing up as those two blobs. They're filled with air. And then that red splotch over there is filled with blood. That's the heart. Now, of course, there are lots of challenges with taking this lab-based technology into the home, because the home is pretty unpredictable. It's very uncontrolled. Again, motion artifact is a big problem, because we are going to be sticking electrodes on the patient's chest, and these electrodes can move transversely and or laterally relative to the patient's skin. This movement is going to cause the uh, contact impedance to change discontinuously, is going to cause um, friction-induced triboelectric current. All of these things are just going to confound our measurement of the boundary voltage. Breathing effects, that's a huge thing as well. So as we're trying to make these images, the patient is going to be breathing normally. And with every breath cycle, the patient's chest changes drastically in volume. The patient's, uh, the impedance we're seeing also changes drastically because the lungs will first be filling with air and then emptying of air. So that's also a huge issue. And then there's this other concern of high performance instrumentation. So if we want this imaging to be successful, we need pretty high quality instrumentation. We need instrumentation that can handle a 90 dB dynamic range of input voltages, and we need it to do this over a frequency range of 10 megahertz. Now, if we try to do this with a linear circuit design, we would end up with an instrumentation box that consumed several watts of power. So we're gonna have this huge, this huge amount of power that has to be somehow dissipated. It will be dissipated as heat. And so because of patient safety, we would have to keep the instrumentation sort of to the side. 
and then run relatively long cables from the electronics to the electrodes that are on the patient's chest. All right, now we don't want long cables because long cables are going to cause crosstalk between the various channels of the measurement system and the long cables are going to act as low pass filters and that will severely limit our ability to do high frequency measurements. Okay, so we are looking at all of these and other problems, but I want us to focus on this issue of high performance instrumentation. The primary reason why the instrumentation design is so challenging is that we have to figure out a way to capture this wide dynamic range of input voltages, okay? Now there's a way around this, and that is automatic gain control, or AGC. The idea with AGC is you put this block at the beginning of your instrumentation signal processing chain, right at the beginning. And what the AGC does is it takes this large dynamic range of signals and then it squashes it into a much more limited dynamic range. The nice thing about this is that all of the subsequent components in your signal processing chain don't have to burn so much power because they're only dealing with a signal that has got a limited dynamic range. <coughs> Now, AGC is a pretty common trick used in engineering. We even see it in nature. Okay, AGC is the way we're able to see in bright sunlight as well as in a darkened auditorium. Okay? But there is a price that we pay for using AGC, and that has to do with latency. Automatic gain control requires two things. It first of all needs to know what the amplitude of the signal is and then it needs to reconfigure its gain to set the signal to be fixed within some dynamic range. And these two steps, amplitude detection and reconfiguration, add a significant amount of delay to our measurement. The best we can hope to do with conventional AGC is to increase our latency by over two which is bad. We, we actually want a very, very fast measurement system. Okay? So we're developing this thing called fast AGC, and it is based on two simple ideas. One is trigonometric amplitude detection, and the other is feedforward cancellation. So let's look at these guys in turn, starting with the, the trig amplitude detection. Now, trig amplitude detection is based on a very simple concept, and it's, it's because we know that the signal that we are measuring is actually a sinusoid. So if you know you're dealing with a sinusoid, it's actually not a hard thing to figure out what its amplitude is. We take the sinusoid, we shift it by 90 degrees, square it, add it to the square of the original signal, and add it up, and we've got the square of the amplitude. Okay, so pretty straightforward. And this is what a block diagram would look like. We would take our input X, run it through this high pass filter, that's how we do the 90 degree shift, square it, add it to the square of the original signal, run it through an ADC and we have our amplitude, okay? Now, the thing is that with an actual real life signal, we can't expect to have really nice clean sinusoids. There's going to be a bunch of noise on it. So it's a good idea to smooth our signal before running it through the amplitude detection. And we are looking at using a median filter because the median filter has this nice characteristic of maintaining sharp edges in the original signal while getting rid of high frequency noise. Okay, so let's, let's just look really quickly at some of the circuit details of a few of these blocks. So let's look at the... Uh, Squaring sum of squares portion of our, D, of our component. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to take Vx and square it and add it to the sum of Vy, add it to the square of Vy. The circuit implementation looks a little like this. And um, we've got Vx over here and Vx over there, and Vy here and there. These are our inputs. So if we look at the currents flowing through transistors M2 and M4, the currents look like this. 
the thing to note is that we've got this square term around this huge um, summation, and I2 looks very similar to I4. The only difference is that there's a negative sign here and there's a positive sign here. So if you were to add these two currents up, you would actually get rid of all terms except for the Vx squared term and a bunch of constants. There's a similar thing going on with the Vy transistors. This is what the currents look like. And again, we've got this difference in the sign between this Vy and that Vy. So all we do is we add up all these four currents and we end up with our square terms, the summation and the constant. And that's basically how we do the sum of squares. The reason I'm showing this is that it's generally kind of tricky to square and sum signals, but using this idea, it's, um, it's again the translinear principle, we're able to do it with a relatively small number of transistors with relatively little amount of power consumption. Okay. And then with the median filter, we used an approach called percentile filter, percentile, let's see, percentile tracking filtering, excuse me. And with percentile tracking filtering, the idea is we take our input and look at its peak and take the, take the same input and look at its trough. So the minimum and maximum of our input. If we average these, then assuming our noise that we're trying to filter out is uniformly distributed, we will actually get the median of our signal. Okay, but the noise is not uniformly distributed. It's actually normally distributed. So it turns out that this is just an estimation, but a very good one at that. Okay, so at the end of the day, we put this all together, put it in our trigonometric amplitude detection block, and then we tested just how fast our system was enabled to detect amplitudes and react to them. Okay, so we looked at the input and we put in this sinusoid and changed its amplitude every two cycles and then looked at what the output looked like. This is what we got. The red line is the input. We're changing that every two cycles in amplitude and the blue line is the output response. So as you can see, we've got this fairly fast response. We do have a couple of glitches over here and there, and that is because that is when the circuit is still trying to determine the amplitude of our system, of our incoming signal. Okay. Then the other portion that we need in order to have a fast AGC is this thing called feedforward cancellation. I want to explain what exactly it is that the feedforward cancellation is trying to solve. So remember, the AGC is going to be changing the gain of the system in order to make its output fit within a predetermined dynamic range. So let's say that we start off with a gain of A0, and the output of that amplifier is X0 the output of this filter. This is the anti-aliasing filter that comes before the ADC. That is Y naught. Then let's say that the AGC reconfigured the system, right? So we went from a gain of A naught to a gain of A1. Now the output of the amplifier has gone from X naught to X1. What we would like is for the output of the filter to go from Y naught to Y1. But because the filter is band limited, we have that Y1 term, and then we have this old Y0 term from before, and it's slowly dying. It's a slowly dying transient. So it is this transient signal that is causing latency in our AGC. And what the uh, feedforward cancellation scheme is trying to do is it's trying to get rid of that term, okay? It does it by using an auxiliary feedforward filter. Let's see how it works. So let's look again at the scenario where we have a gain of A0. We've got X0 at the output of the amplifier and Y0 at the output of our filter. What we do is we connect X0 to the auxiliary filter. And so the output of this auxiliary filter is also Y0. It's tracking that of the main filter. 
then let's imagine that the AGC reconfigured our gain. We go from A0 to A1. The output of the amplifier is now X1. And as before, the output of the filter is Y1. We still have that annoying transient term, the slowly dying Y0. Okay? But if at the same time as reconfiguration, we throw open the input of our filter, our auxiliary filter here, then we'll find that the output of this auxiliary filter is also the same transient that we see up here. So all we have to do is to subtract it from our main signal, and we get Y1 as desired. So this is how feedforward cancellation works. And these sets of uh, plots illustrate the impact of using this feedforward cancellation scheme. Without feedforward cancellation, that transient term takes up about 30% of an entire cycle to die out. With feedforward cancellation, the transient is almost non existent. Okay? So, in summary, with conventional AGC, we suffer this latency hit. Our measurement increases by more than a factor of two. With this new fast AGC concept, our measurement uh, latency is more or less not affected. And so going back to this problem of designing high performance instrumentation, we've been able to design something that can handle a wide dynamic range signal and at low power because we're using AGC. But not only that, we're able to maintain low latency and a high frame rate because it's using these concepts that are described in the fast AGC system. So I just want to say a few final thoughts. We are at a very, very interesting point today. Healthcare costs are rising and that is being uh, driven primarily by chronic disease care. At the same time, completely separately, computation has become ubiquitous, cheap, and very powerful. Communications and networking have just exploded. So what exactly is it that is stopping us from applying advances in communication and computation to solving the problems of healthcare. The issue is that there is this very, very serious bottleneck that sits right at the interface of the physical world, where we've got all these biophysiological signals, and the digital world, where all of this exciting uh, uh, technology is advancing. And translating information between these worlds is not an easy task. So what I'm trying to do in my research is to break this bottleneck. And that is what this, this is all about. Um, I should end the talk by thanking the people in my lab who actually do real work. I just come up with these crazy ideas. So all of my graduate students and undergraduate students, past and present, thank you. And I've also had the pleasure and good fortune of working with a lot of collaborators across campus. So I'm very thankful to them. And of course, none of this would be possible without the generosity of uh, my funding sponsors. And of course, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank you for your time. Normal lungs are not silent, no. But we do want 
the center to ignore anything that is normal. My other one was, you mentioned that on the uh, construction of the image of the lungs and heart, that the lungs had a low impedance, the heart had a high impedance. I would have thought it was the other way around. I may have had that the other way around. Yes. Okay. You, you said that. This is in relation to the feedforward cancellation. Yeah. Uh, we're actually not sampling there. We are actually dealing with a continuous time system. So, oh, yeah, okay. so yeah. Question up there. Uh, I can see if I'm wearing one of these devices, it might give me advance warning of when I need to take action uh, or go to the emergency room. But how would it reduce visits to the emergency room? That's a very good question. And I actually do not know the answer to that. Um, but I think that the general idea is that if you, are, if you are aware of your asthma symptoms and your medication use, if you're keeping track of this, the chances of you um, just being hit suddenly by this exacerbation out of nowhere reduce significantly. So the, the point where you will be having to go to the emergency room will not even be reached because you would have been taken good care of your, yourself. Your fast AGC system seems like a, a really nice innovation. And, it, and since, as you say, AGC is used a lot of places, it seems like it would have more applications. Do you see? other applications that you think it will go into? Yeah, um, it could be applied in RF systems. And perhaps power, power systems, where if you're trying to figure out the frequency and the amplitude of your, your signal. Yeah. I don't, think, I don't think the design would change terribly because if the, uh, if the child is more active, we can expect an adult, some adults to be perhaps equally as active. Um, if there are variations in breathing rate, well, in an adult population, there are also variations in breathing rate. So we would sort of have to just take all of this into account. And I also talked about algorithms that would be trained on generic data sets, but would also have the ability to learn as they are being used by a specific patient. So that is sort of a, a way to, to address that problem, not just the difference between the pediatric population and adults, but across all patients. We talked about uh, very impressive low power for the acoustic monitoring. What about the EIT? What's, what are the power requirements there? Can you get those down? Um, so we're trying to get them down. And part, part of the um, approach is using automatic gain control. But the power requirements, I don't think, are that severe for EIT as they are for the asthma application. And the reason is we're envisioning that the patient will use the EIT system maybe once a day. 
they sit down, strap this thing on, wear it for a minute or two, and then take it off. And, and so it'll just be sitting there. Yeah. For the asthma situation, what would be the, um, would there be some relevant advantages of like an accelerometer as opposed to an acoustic measure? It seems like there's been a lot of advances on that front with various wearable devices. We're actually going to have an accelerometer in addition to a contact microphone. The accelerometer would be used to measure motion artifact and we'll use the accelerometer data to sort of clean up the contact microphone signal. Now using the accelerometer by itself to measure lung sounds, I think that's a little more difficult than just using a piezoelectric transducer. I've seen more about coughing, but I guess lungs out there. Yeah, so there's nothing stopping us from including an accelerometer to figure out that the person is coughing. That's right. And, you know, it seems, I, I don't know the skill very much, but it seems to me like 90% of what I hear about is the digital side. Yeah. Digital electronics, digital processing. I hear very little about the creativity on the analog input side. And I've always felt like once you digitize, you can't go back, right? Which is probably so, and there can be a lot lost. Uh, so, is the balance, what is the balance commercially today? That's an excellent question. So, so that, that's why I had this slide up here, because I anticipated that. Um, yeah, uh, Google can do what Google is doing. That's great. Um, we need all of these advances on the digital side. But the point I'm trying to make is that when you're looking at applications like I described, you need to somehow talk to the physical world. And that is never going to happen unless you have a translator, and that translation is done by analog and mixed signal circuits. So the more powerful we, we get on the digital domain, the more we're going to demand of the analog and mixed signal circuits. So I can speculate. <laughs> um, I, I think that we are perhaps maybe two or three years out from having devices that will be comfortable giving to large populations of patients for testing. In terms of commercialization, maybe four years. Are you testing these on, on small patient populations right now? Your graduate students? <laughs> No. <laughs> um, so for the EIT system, the idea is to, we've actually got an IRB approval for this. The idea is that we're going to be testing on patients that come in to get right heart cath cath catheterizations. And the RHC is sort of the gold standard for figuring out cardiac output. So we're going to be measuring our device and its output and comparing that to right heart, catheter, right heart catheterization. And then with the asthma device, we are, we are trying to get a prototype ready that will be robust, because the idea is that the patient is going to be moving around doing their normal daily routine. So getting the mechanics of that is kind of difficult and that's really where we're stuck at right now. Yeah. Uh, Laura? I have a completely different question, not about the technology, and maybe it's a little unfair, but um, what's the status of um, the infrastructure for telemedicine? And how um, are there models for monetizing it? Because if you have these devices, there's got to be someone at the other end
Yeah. There are these things called accountable care organizations. And the idea is that, I, I, I don't know the details, but my rough understanding is, the idea is for each patient they have, they are given a chunk of money for the year. And that's it. That's all the hospital gets. So it is in the hospital's interest to keep the patient away from the hospital and away from their resources. So having, having devices like this would definitely help. And it doesn't have to be fancy technology like this. We can have nurses calling you up and saying, have you taken your medications? You know, have you been exercising? This sort of thing. So everything from phone calls to fancy devices like this um, are all going towards reducing the amount of money and resources that is spent per patient. Yeah, there is. Um, I guess we could potentially put more computation on the device itself. That's one way. We could save a lot of the data, and when the user passed by a hub, it would recognize it and send its information to it. Um, so these are two things off the top of my head. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an assumption that we're making that the user will have a smartphone on them. And that might not be true in all cases. Yeah, my, my question had to do with going back to uh, the original point about analog versus digital. Isn't it true that the digital communications at, at high bandwidth are very expensive in energy? Uh, and that a reason for staying in analog That's right. So I, I um, alluded to that when I said if we included compressive sensing to our scheme, it will reduce power even more. So compressive sensing just allows you to sample at less than the Nyquist rate, and you're still able to extract all of the information that you need. Compressive sensing? Yeah, if, if, as he's, he's, so the two limits are you take the data and you instantly convert it to digital, or you keep it analog as long as possible. And, the, and I assume that the trades offs here have to do with the power consumption. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is that if you made everything digital right away, Yes, yes, that's correct. Because when you talk about converting everything to digital immediately, that, that is putting a huge burden on the analog component. So we're going to be basically transferring just tons and tons and tons of data. A lot of that is going to be thrown away. And, but for every single bit we convert, we need to burn a bunch of power. So if there's a way to balance things whereby you are trying to do some smart processing in analog, but not so smart, not, not things that really are best left for digital, but at the same time you are not converting things unnecessarily, then there's a way to get that nice balance and save power overall. So the lesson is you need to learn both digital and analog. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I, I would say so. Um, are you involved in the vibrational um, energy harvesting, and is there electronics to make that more efficient? 
I'm not involved. I'm hoping that I can um, lure some of my colleagues to <laughs> help me with that. <laughs> Thank you.